talked about uh, corporate governance in the last class, and today we're going to discuss a little bit more about some problems with the current corporate governance, and we're going to look at one suggestion called network governance, which is being used by Visa and Madrigon and some other companies. It's a relatively new way of doing uh, corporate governance. So we look, there's an article about that in the Harvard Business Review that we'll look at. Have you heard about the Harvard Business Review? HBR, Harvard Business Review. If you want to practice your English and learn about business, I can recommend to go to the just now you can just type in Google HBR. Harvard HBR and then you'll get the Harvard Business Review. So Harvard Business Review is quite expensive to subscribe. Maybe if you have an Amazon Kindle or e-reader, you can subscribe for maybe $3 a month or something like that. If you want to get the paper edition, it costs, I think, about $10 or $11 a month. So here on the website, you can get some free uh, articles also. Right? Uh, it's a magazine where people do research and they write about what they found in the short way and easier to understand than in journals. Okay? And often the leading researchers are write articles because they want to be published in the Harvard Business Review. It's kind of good for them. It's a magazine, right? So here we have innovation metrics. So if somebody has some new ideas they can write about that here. So I think this is a good magazine if you want to choose a magazine like The Economist. Do you know The Economist? Or Time Magazine. But the Harvard Business Review I think is better than those ones. Okay, it costs more. The research is a bit higher quality. So here, just that you can see on the home page, how to give a killer presentation, right? Do you want to learn how to give a killer presentation? Hmm? Yes or no? then you can uh, read about that in your own time. Okay, but today we're looking at an article, we look at one article from the Harvard Business Review about corporate governance. Okay? And we have the idea here in the PPT and the file. So, the idea is network governance. Do you understand network? We have computer network. So we're looking at the criticism of the current system of corporate governance and we're going to suggest an alternative. So the current corporate governance system, we have a view of individuals and firms which is based on economics. In this article they call this uh, homo economics, so let's look at the, uh, the PDF file. Maybe you have opened the PDF file already. So, this says the rise of homo economics, right? Uh, this idea, again, we have Adam Smith, a utilitarian idea that humans are self serving, Every, people think in their own interest. This is the traditional idea. Okay, and the main function of the company is to make wealth. The main function of the state is to provide safety. So, uh, we're on page two here, on the middle of page two here. So, uh, <coughs> companies focus on shareholder value, creating shareholder value, and we have a top-down control mechanism. So, top-down system in the corporate governance. So, do you understand hierarchy? Hierarchy? Hierarchy means uh, like I'm higher than you, you're higher than me, you're higher than me. Hierarchy. Okay. Uh, so, we have incentives and controls and contracts. 
So it's kind of contracts which are constantly negotiated. What is the role of the leader? The leader's role is to clarify goals, set incentives, ensure compliance. This is called a transactional leader. We discussed a little bit about leaders before, type of leadership, right? So in corporate governance, this is the traditional one. The leader makes the goals, they give incentives. Do you understand the incentive? So you do this, then you get a raise or get a promotion. Uh, they ensure compliance means they make sure people follow the rules. So probably they have some punishment if people don't comply. Okay? So they communicate their goals and they top down way like a carrot and stick approach, right? <coughs> if you don't do it, you get the stick. If you do do it, you get incentive, you get a carrot. Okay? That is transactional leadership. In this leadership, relationships are not so important. Okay? Uh, then we have the different uh, type that they're suggesting here. This is a humanistic. Do you understand humanistic? <laughs> humanistic means more human, more feeling. So this, in this perspective, humans are relationship focused and they have their own values. They exercise their freedom through their values. They value long-term relationships. They want to serve humanity, okay? So, we are saying that people, if people were left alone, anyway they would go out and work. They want to do something. People want to serve humanity, they have their own values, okay? Uh, people are just balancing their own interests with those of people around them. So, I'm not, in the first case, I'm just thinking of my own interest, okay? Well, in this case, I'm balancing my interests with other people's interests. I'm thinking about my interests and also other people's interests. And I'm using my own values. So, <coughs> this is a little bit different idea. So, this assumes that people are intrinsically motivated and driven by higher order needs. Intrinsically motivated means you're motivated inside yourself. Are you intrinsically motivated to do well or extrinsically motivated in your life? Or do you only study hard because you get some reward? You think you'll get a higher salary? Or your parents tell you to study? Or do you study hard because you want to do well for society and help society? <laughs> Prove yourself to help society. Which one? Huh? What do you think? Are people intrinsically or extrinsically motivated? If, you're, if you think people are extrinsically motivated, then you're going to like this one, top down, okay? Give them an incentive, then they'll work harder, right? Punish them, then they won't, they'll work harder, okay? But if you think people are intrinsically motivated, you might think, I don't need to punish them and I don't need to give them an incentive, right? They have a different type of motivation. Okay, so it depends on your view. What do you think about people? Okay? If you're hiring somebody, would you prefer to hire somebody who has their own motivation or somebody who is motivated by you or from the outside? Which kind of person would you prefer to hire? Which kind of person would you prefer to hire if you're a boss? Somebody who's motivated inside or somebody who's motivated from the outside? Why? Okay. They're easier to manage, right? We don't have to be always watching them or trying to give them incentives or give them some encouragement. Okay? So just a tip for you if you're going for a job interview. It's a good idea to show the employer that you are intrinsically motivated. One way people can show employers that they are intrinsically motivated is by doing volunteer work. Okay? If I see that you did some volunteer work and you didn't, I would say that, oh, maybe this guy is intrinsically motivated. He wants to do well for society. He's not just thinking about money and uh, motivated from outside, being told what to do. Okay? So if he comes to my company, 
maybe I don't have to motivate him that much. Anyway, he did this kind of volunteer work, so it seems to me that he wants to do good things for society. So that's why people like to have some volunteer work on their, on their resume. Okay? Any other way you can show an employer that you are internally motivated? It's important these days. Maybe if you make a, your own blog, right, about something, your shows you're interested in that area, you're ready to do, make your own blog, right? You set up your own club. Doing those kind of things can show that you're intrinsically motivated. So if we have intrinsically motivated staff, then we think that they are, they are thinking more about self-actualization. Self-actualization means uh, doing what I want to do in my life with higher values. Okay? So just constantly monitoring them is just not used. Excuse means not used. Okay? So this kind of way, if we think of people in this kind of way, we use the more democratic institutions and this kind of governance. So they're suggesting in this article that people are more intrinsically motivated and we should, because of that, we should use the network governance. Do you agree with them? Do you think people are intrinsically motivated or externally motivated? Discuss with your partner. What do you think? So imagine you're a boss in a company. What do you think? Do you think your workers are internally motivated or externally motivated? So generally. What about if you hire your friends? What do you think? Think about the people you know. Show of hands, how many people think people are intrinsically motivated? How many people think people are ex externally motivated? Okay, everybody needs to put up your hand. Who thinks people are internally motivated, generally? Just one, two people. Who thinks people are externally motivated? Okay, then maybe you don't like this suggestion, right? Then you want to keep the traditional corporate governance top-down approach. Okay, you want to monitor your employees, give them incentives, and so on. But this is a little bit different way of looking at things. And I have, from my work experience, if I was to hire somebody, finding an internally motivated person would be very important because uh, we can't always monitor people practically. We can't always manage people and check that they're doing their job properly, right? They can always cut corners and uh, you know just don't do any work. So before I used to manage some staff. So I found that some staff don't. If they have a chance, they avoid working, right? They don't work. So I'll, I'll, that's not everybody. Some people, right? So I think one solution is to hire people who are internally motivated. So if I'm hiring people in future, I'm going to look for people who have internal motivation. How can I find out those things? It's hard to know in an interview, right? But you look at the person's background, what were they doing outside of their normal activities, okay? So many companies these days are looking for people like that, okay? So it's growing trend that uh, people will be uh, internally motivated, and then if we assume that, then we can use a different type of, of governance. Corporate governance. Yes? Uh, let's assume that I have a company and 
in an interview he was like, oh, I am inter not a motivated person. Yes. I like that, so I hired him, but mm. finally I realized that he is externally motivated person. Yes. But he is very useful. He's very talented. I want to keep him for a long time in our company. Yes. But I don't like his motivated way, so how can I find the middle, like common ground for that? What do you mean common ground? Like, um, like agreement. How can you find like agreement? Uh, well, you can manage them well also if they're externally motivated. Just, I say I prefer, and these days people prefer internally motivated people. Mm -hmm. But you can also use the type of incentives or punishment. Monitoring, controlling, make some system to monitor them. Like uh, uh, they have open plan office. Do you know open plan office? No. Open plan office means that they're not in their own office with their own desk and computer. They're in an office with everybody. Anybody can see their computer. So you can see that they're not playing uh, PC games on their computer, right? It's an open office, so everybody can look at their computer. So you can make some system, right, that they are just being controlled or monitored. And then you can also give them incentives, like for their result. If they get a result, they get some extra money or promotion, right? People who work in sales, for example, they get commission, right? Yeah. That kind of thing. So you could find a way to manage that, that kind of person, right? Too. There are people, a lot of people are extrinsically motivated, too. So that, I'm not saying that's wrong, I'm just saying in my opinion, I prefer to hire people who are internally motivated, and these days many companies are looking for people like that, too. Right? Uh, I guess it could be a little bit of a cultural difference between Korea also and the US or Ireland because in Korea some companies like the top-down system where the employees follow the instructions very closely but in the US they, want the they, do they don't want to spend a lot of time giving instructions to the employees. They, they are busy doing something else so they want the employees to come up with their own ideas right and come up with their own projects and uh, do their own work right so it depends on the job but a lot of jobs they have just uh, not much control or supervision in of these days not much monitoring of the employees so the employee has to be internally motivated to go out and start their own club or start their own program start their own thing right so that's why I'm saying if you do that kind of thing in the university now, you start your own club or start your own blog or start your own, do some voluntary work, then it's showing the employees that later, when you have a job, you'll also be able to take the initiative and uh, do those kind of things, right? So uh, it's just that different people have different... Uh, ways of thinking, right? So Aristotle thought that people were like this. Aristotle thought that people were intrinsically motivated, okay? So, different people have different views. So this network governance, we're saying that taking the humanistic perspective, so people are internally uh, motivated, okay? So, we are going to, in this case, we are going to involve multiple stakeholders in governance. We're going to have various boards at different levels. And these are going to act as checks and balances and cultivate or make uh, transparency and trust in the organization. So the transactional leader, we have transaction costs because we expect that people can abuse the system in their own interest. So a transaction cost is I have to supervise you, I have to monitor you. Okay, so I have to pay for some way to monitor you, that's a cost. Why? Because I don't trust you, and I think you're going to abuse the system. Okay? Abusing the system would be like playing computer games instead of working, or uh, stealing money, doing anything wrong. Right? So I need to monitor you, and I need to pay money for this. So how do we solve this problem? We give people incentives to work well for the company. For example, our company makes more profit, you get a bonus. 
So I make a goal for you. You need to make a 10% increase in sales this year. And then you will get your bonus. And this ensures that you're not going to be playing computer games. You're going to be working, right? Because you want to get your bonus. Then we have the humanistic leadership with people relationship focused, guided by human values, prioritize long-term relationships. Okay, uh, we already mentioned this. People want personal recognition and personal growth. So actually they did some study into Korea. Uh, they said, why do Korean students score so well on the international test? But the salary of the Korean middle school teachers, right? They test all the 15 year old students, so middle or high school. But the salary of the uh, middle school teachers is relatively lower in society compared to the other areas, right? In other countries, the teacher earns more money relatively than in Korea. So they found out that the teachers wanted the personal recognition in Korea. The teacher had some status because they were a teacher, right? In society. So they found out that this was important to them as well as the salary. So they were still able to attract some good teachers in Korea for this reason. So people are more motivated if they're included in decision making. Do you feel more motivated if you're included in the decision making or if you're just told what to do? Decision making. Yes, this is important. I think this could also be a cultural difference. It's important if you're working with Western people to make them feel involved in decision making. Right? If they are not involved in decision making, they feel unmotivated. Okay? Mm -hmm. So it means that people ask you before they make a decision which affects you. Right? Even if they don't follow what you said, at least they asked you. So you feel involved. So we can make uh, committees or boards at all levels. So. Let's look at some criticisms of the current uh, corporate governance system. So, the 2008 financial crisis, uh, again, was a failure of corporate governance. So, some people say the main reason for the financial crisis in 2008 was the corporate governance system failed. So, the board of directors didn't properly uh, control the managers, right? Or the owners couldn't control the managers properly. So why not? Uh, just looking at the traditional way, we said is more top-down, traditional way of corporate governance. So there was some communication breakdown. Information can get lost in hierarchical layers. So if we have a top-down system, here we have the people at the top, and then so on and so on, right? So I tell this person some information. Okay? Then they change it a little bit and tell that person. They change it a little bit and tell that person. They change the information and tell that person. They get a, a different information than I want to tell them, right? I tell them, oh, this financial product is really risky. We shouldn't be selling this to customers, right? Then they say, oh, the financial product is risky. Then they say, there's something a little bit wrong with the financial product. And then they say, hmm. This financial product is not perfect to the boss. Okay, do you understand? Have you ever heard of Chinese with played Chinese whispers? Hmm? Do you know Chinese whispers game? You play in the ESL class. Do you want to play now? I write some note and she reads whispers to you, whispers to you, whispers to her. Then the person at the end of the line has to write on the board. Hmm? Do you want to try? <laughs> no? Anyway, that's what can happen in the hierarchical system, okay? The message can get distorted. But it can be biased because this person doesn't want to lose their job, right? So they want, maybe they, they want to say that it's not that risky, okay? Or it can be just false. Whistleblowers can be fired when the company's reputation is at stake in this kind of system. We have individual biases and group dynamics, overconfidence, anchoring, escalation of commitment, group think, and group shift. So we, we talked about some of these before, but let's look at the PDF file. 
to look at these problems, group problems, kind of new research about these problems. So just go down to the bottom of page uh, 5, individual biases and group dynamics. So let's read uh, this part about the group dynamics, I think it's uh, useful in any case. So, humans, like computers, have processing and storage limits. We filter information in two ways, by selecting what is familiar and focusing on that, or choosing what supports a certain perspective or ideology which we hold. So it means that when we hear information, we have a bias. We hear, do you ever hear the expression, people hear what they want to hear? Did you ever hear that expression in English? You hear what you want, right? Somebody is telling me something, I select what I know about, I understand, okay, focus on that, or I select what I agree with, what is agreeing with me, and guess what, I forget the rest of the information. I don't listen or I forget the rest of the information, right? This has been identified in research, okay? Another bias we have is overconfidence. We think that our own judgment is better than other people's. Okay, if you look at history, you can see a lot of leaders who were overconfident. They didn't listen to their generals. They told them, I know best. I know better than you, right? But they should have listened to people more. Anchoring. Anchoring is we rely too much on one piece of information to make a decision. Do you know an anchor? Anchor looks like this. I'm not very good at art. There's a ship. You put the anchor to keep the ship steady. The ship doesn't move. So I, I don't understand everything, but I, I just understand one piece of information. So I just use this one piece of information to make my decision. That's called anchoring. Escalation of commitment I've seen is a problem in the real life. Uh, so this, I think a lot of people have this problem. So I make a view, I have I get involved in an art, in a discussion right, and somebody told me something and I think what I I say is right. My opinion is right. Now you we have a discussion, and you're actually making a very reasonable point, and it seems like I could be wrong, and you could be right. Okay, but a lot of people are quite stubborn, even though it seems like he's making a reasonable point. They don't change their mind. In fact, they get even more. They escalate, means go up. You go up the escalator in the department store, right? Escalate means to go up. So we escalate commitment. Even though we, we can see now that we are wrong, the evidence seems to show we are wrong, we, we already made a commitment to this idea or this point. So we are going to continue with this idea or this point, even though it appears that we are now wrong. Okay? So this is not... If you have that kind of attitude in the workplace, then you're not going to move up in the workplace. You won't make a good relationship with people and you won't move up. So people actually respect people who can say, yes, you've convinced me. Okay? I had this idea and I had this opinion, but your idea is better. Okay? You've changed my mind. Okay? So people should be able to do that. But are people able to do that? Did you ever say that to anybody? Hmm? Yes, I, I, I thought this way before, but your argument is very good, so now you've changed my mind and you're right. Did you ever say that to anybody? No? Right? So, people don't usually say that, right? They usually just keep going with their own idea. So, we have this kind of problem. Uh, Groupthink, we talked about before. Group think is when we have the desire for consensus and we want a positive group feeling. So we don't actually analyze the situation properly. Okay? We all just agree with each other and everybody's happy. Okay? And usually group think problem, we're all from the same background. We went to the same kind of university. We're all either men or women. Okay? That kind of thing. Group shift is uh, when if we all make a decision together as a group, we're less guilty than making as an individual. Okay? I don't know if you saw on the t 
TV, but there was some video where somebody got stabbed. And then a lot of people walked by the person. They got stabbed with a knife, and they were on the street bleeding. But it was at the metro station, and everybody was walking by. And they said the reason that pe people were walking by is because everybody else walked by. Nobody stopped. Maybe if there was just one person there, they would have stopped. But they saw everybody else walking past, so they just followed everybody else. So it's like herding or safety in the group. So the group shift means that we can make a bad decision because everybody is making the bad decision. So everybody is taking the responsibility. So these are some kind of research or problem with the uh, kind of psychological problem with the uh, financial crisis and the boards, boards of directors during the financial crisis. Okay, other problems, uh, lack of external accountability and control. The board of directors decide their own pay. They choose their own auditors. Also, information overload. So we talked about before that the board of directors spend just a few hours every week working in the company. They might not have the expertise, they have another job, they're not educated in that area. So they don't understand, right? I tell them, this financial product is not perfect. They don't even understand the financial product well, because they didn't get a proper education about finance, okay? Or there's just too much information. They don't have time to read everything. So because of these problems, we have this suggestion called network governance to uh, solve this problem. So we are going to look at each of these things. The first one is minimize the communication risk. So cross-checking improves uh, communications. So when journalists uh, get some information for a story, do they just print the story immediately? If, it, if you go to the journalist in the newspaper and tell them some scandal or some story, are they going to just say, oh, that's great, and then start writing the story and publish it? No. What are they going to do? They should check on another. Cross-checking. Cross-checking, right? They're going to check with another source. So it's been proven that cross-checking is important for information. Okay? Uh, it improves the communication. We get more reliable information when we cross-check. So first of all, let's look at the network uh, governance. Uh, so look at your document and look at the exhibit one. So here we can see this is the idea, right? It's in the traditional way, we would just have the board of directors here, okay, and the shareholders here. But in this case, we have more. We have a ma we have the board of directors is split into two boards: management board and governance board. We have a stakeholder congress here. Do you understand congress? Like group, right? So who's on the stakeholder congress? We have a representative of each of our stakeholders. Okay? One from the customers, one from the employees, one from the community, the local community, one from the suppliers. So we can see here that uh, we are also in involving the stakeholder or the community and society with the board of directors, which is not traditionally they don't have to think about that. Traditionally, they're only answering to the shareholders and just thinking about these people, right? But in this type of way, they're also answering to these people. Okay? They have representative from each of these areas. They make a congress. They have a chairperson, and the management replies to the shareholders, and the governance board replies to the shareholders, and they all reply to the stakeholder congress. So this is a new uh, type of structure. <coughs> so we can see that uh, in this one, we can check our information better. So. <coughs> We can see here that uh, some examples, HP, do you know HP? 
Yes. And Shell, sure. they use this kind of stakeholder council to advise their boards. Okay, the Electric Safety Authority in Canada, they also use this kind of stakeholder council. So, one of the ideas is about the information. The information is higher quality because we're getting the information from different areas, different stakeholders. Okay? So the customers, in this case, instead of just through the hierarchical system being told about this financial risk, we hear from the customers, from the employees directly to the board of directors, not through all of these channels, right? Directly, employee representative can tell the board of directors, okay, the customers, somebody else. So <coughs> the information can travel more directly to the board. So the information will also be more balanced, not biased. Okay. Uh, so this kind of group ship thing and group ship can be avoided because we have board is split into two, right? We have governance board and management board. So by splitting into two, we're helping to solve the group think, and also by involving more people from different backgrounds. Uh, <coughs> checks and balances are important. Do you understand checks and balances? Checks and balances means that balance is we don't want somebody to be too powerful. So we need to have a check, some way to balance things. So who runs the court in Korea? Does the president run the court or not? No. No, it's independent, right? Why is that? Why are the courts independent from the president? To balance. To balance, right? If the president had also ran the courts, he would be too powerful. Okay? So the court is separate from the government. So this guy in, from France, Montesquieu, he proposed checks and balances based on executive, legislative, and judicial branches to prevent abuse of power. So in the US, they have the president, then they have Congress. Okay, and then they have the court. They're the three main powers. So the president can veto something from Congress. It means he doesn't agree with something Congress proposed. He can say, no, we're not doing that. Okay? Congress can also do the same to the president. The president wants to do something, but Congress doesn't agree. The politician, rest of the politicians don't agree, then he can't do that. Okay? The court, the court can stop the government from doing something or force the government to do something. So the power is checked. It is, some people are criticized this in the US because Obama says he can't do anything, right? Because every time Obama wants to do something, the legislative, the Republican Party control the Congress, so they stop him. So mainly he was only able to do his healthcare program and another couple of small things, okay? So they have to negotiate with each other. Obama has to constantly negotiate with the opposite, with the Congress, to get things done. So it's kind of stopping one person from having too much power. So this kind of network governance system is also making that kind of uh, checks and balances. <coughs> so uh, a visa and another bank, the do you know the Red Cross, they also use this kind of system, but they also split up uh, representatives according to geography. So they can uh, solve the problem of the information overload, the second problem. So we have multiple boards, it means that each board can do one task and share the information better. So here we see Mondragon, maybe you don't know this, but it has 83,000 workers in Spain. It's a cooperative with a lot of uh, stakeholder cooperatives. So they are involved in different businesses. And they have, we can see all of the councils that they have here. For, for, they have a management board, supervisory board, social council, work unit with the employees, watchdog council. A watchdog oversees everything. Do you understand watchdog? Watchdog is like a guard dog. A dog who protects the house. 
So di different companies have a slightly different setup. Okay, but because of these number of different uh, boards, they can <coughs> deal with the information better. Then uh, the final one is an eye on the thermostat. Do you understand thermostat? Thermostat is in your house, you have a thermostat on the wall. When it, you put the heat for 20 degrees, when it goes over 20 degrees, automatically the thermostat puts off, stops uh, heating the house. Okay? So this means that uh, eye on the thermostat means that we have a better feeling for the, uh, what's happening. Okay? So, because we can engage the stakeholder participants who can help the board, uh, we call this kind of organizational thermostat or co-regulator. So they can give us some information, just like the thermostat gives the information about the heat and then cuts off. They can give us some vital information and we can cut off some risk or bad program. Okay? So we can monitor the problems better and mitigate risk, solve the risk. Okay? So in this company, John Lewis Partnership, the employees elect officers and they serve on these different committees. And these officers can tell if there's some risk or some problem. So just uh, to sum up, can we, would this, if we had, every company had this kind of network governance, would it have solved the crisis if the banks had network governance? Maybe, maybe not. Okay, people are still human, but we think it could be a better way. Okay, so these days companies are making new corporate governance codes or ways, new laws and regulations are introduced by the government. But like we said, it's very hard to have one policeman on every person. So laws and regulations are only so effective. So, for large complex organizations, if we can uh, give more trust to our employees and our stakeholders, try to involve them more directly with the board of directors, then we can have a better early warning system, okay, and hopefully we should uh, mitigate our risk, and also our workers can be happier. If we believe that our workers are humanistic workers, uh, we involve them more in the governance of the company, then they could be happier. Okay, so then let's uh, check our understanding. So, first of all, discuss with your partner. What is the difference between transactional leadership and humanistic leadership? Yeah. 
Which kind of boss would you like to have? <laughs> Humanistic boss, they trust you more, that you're internally motivated, let you come up with your own ideas and so on. <clears throat> okay, uh, the next uh, question, uh, discuss these problems here with your partner. Of individual bias and group dynamics. Do you understand these problems? <laughs> 